Carnegie Hall. KUNC's Mike Lyle talked with the director, and you can hear that conversation at KUNC.org. With a debt limit clock ticking and the global economy at stake, what did we learn in 2011 when the U.S. came within 72 hours of default? You can't negotiate with a gun to your head. You can't negotiate over default. Congress has to raise the debt limit. I'm Anthony Brooks with House Republicans and President Biden at an impasse. What's the path forward? That's on the next On Point. Listen weekdays at noon here on... I'm Savannah Marr for Marketplace. Stock indexes are mixed on the inflation news. I see the S&P is up two tenths percent. The Dow is down 73 or two tenths percent. The Nasdaq is down six tenths percent. Now the good news from Airbnb is that it had a fine first three months of the year, but the bad news being shared by the firm is that the good times are tapering down. The company says it expects fewer bookings overall when its current quarter is complete at the end of June. Strange, right? Especially with airlines raking it in. Marketplace's Nova Safo is here with some details. Yeah, uh, Airbnb is trying to limit expectations, David, for the weeks ahead. And the reason they're giving is that a year ago during this time, there was unusually good business on Airbnb because of pent-up demand. You may remember that by March of last year, the world had gone through the emergence of the COVID Omicron variant.
two big ideas. First, that the United States was the successor to all the great and glorious traditions of Europe. And second, that it was destined to surpass Europe in every way. They believed America's unique democratic institutions would create a spirit of enterprise unprecedented in history. As Thomas Jefferson put it, no constitution was ever before as well calculated as ours for extending extensive empire and self-government. By the latter half of the 19th century, as population growth and economic expansion pushed the productive territory of the young nation to the Mississippi River and beyond, these visions of American empire became increasingly more grandiose. It was at this auspicious moment that American statehouse architecture entered its golden age. In the 20 years from 1866 to 1886, no fewer than 11 state houses were begun, from Connecticut's elaborate Victorian Gothic edifice to elegant classical structures in Michigan, Texas, and the new centennial state of Colorado. At the furthest frontiers of the new nation, sheer backwardness and isolation might have been expected to make settlers a bit circumspect about this grand vision of empire, but this was far from being the case. The pioneers who settled Colorado in the early 1860s not only believed in American empire, they believed they would one day be at the center of it all. Few believe this more fervently than William Gilpin, soldier, explorer, author, and first territorial governor of Colorado. The existence of the precious and base metals in absolutely inexhaustible abundance and variety, the universal fertility of the soil on the flanks of the great mountains as upon the plains, uniform splendor and sublimity of the climate, the facility of transit and penetration by roads over all varieties of service. These facts promise unrivaled rapidity of progress, prosperity, and power. In fact, early Coloradoans were so convinced of the wealth and power destined to flow into their capital that they spent more than 10 years battling over just where it should be located. Colorado's territorial government had a really hard time finding a home. Uh, not only did it bounce around from place to place within Denver, but it bounced around to Colorado City for a brief period, to Golden as well, and then back to Denver. Denver, for better or for worse, was where the action was, it was where our economy was developing. Besides its size and central location, Denver had one more advantage. In 1867, local developer Henry Cordes Brown offered a 10 acre plot on the edge of town for construction of a state capitol building. Because the site sat at a slight elevation relative to Denver's downtown, it became known as Brown's Plot. However, Brown was no altruist, a fact that would be made clear when he sued the state in 1879 and demanded they return the still undeveloped land. Brown understood that by owning much of the land around the future capital building, he stood to make a fortune. The production of silver and metal was new to millionaires at a dizzying rate, and Denver's elite liked the idea of building their mansion for the area called Capital City. Raising the necessary funds for a capital building was difficult, however, and the project was soon plagued by seemingly endless delays. In 1874, the territorial legislature appointed a new commission to take such action as would enable the building to be completed by January 1st, 1876. The deadline came and went with little progress. In 1876, Colorado finally won its long battle to attain statehood. But to the intense frustration of Henry Brown, the decade would come to a close with no activity on Brown's bluff beyond an annual fireworks show to celebrate Independence Day. Then, in an 1881 referendum, Denver finally won the capital designation once and for all. Denver won it was the largest town, but uh, Colorado voted in Colorado voters, for Granite Grand, people voted for Grand Gold, so the people voted for Silverton, some people threw their votes away and voted for Pikes Peak, and of course Leadville was convinced it was going to be the capital. When the site was finalized, the legislature wasted little time planning construction of the capital. In 1883, they created a board of capital managers and granted them sweeping authority to preside over construction. Then, in the summer of 1885, after a competition that drew architectural submissions from across the nation, the board of capital managers announced that they had selected none other than the most renowned statehouse architect of the day, Elijah E. Myers. At the time, many assumed Myers gained the advantage from his role as architect for Denver's most significant government building to date, the Arapahoe County Courthouse. 
But by the 1880s, Meyer's reputation had gone far beyond courthouses. Meyer had already designed the Michigan Capitol. He designed the Texas State Capitol. In the meantime, he designed a territorial capital for Idaho. And there's no doubt Myers was the architect to have in the Golden Age. He's the Frank Lloyd Wright. He's the Frank Gehry of his time. By 1886, Myers' architectural plan for the capital was approved, and $1 million was appropriated to begin construction. The building would be completed, said the supremely confident capital managers, no later than New Year's Day, 1890, a prediction that would prove to be wildly optimistic. In the end, 15 years would pass between the sound of the first spade striking the ground in that summer of 1886 and the final interior finishes in 1901. The first delays came almost immediately. Laborers digging the foundations had to go 20 feet before reaching bedrock, eight feet more than expected. Other delays followed. In 1890, when they expected to celebrate the building's completion, the capital managers instead joined tens of thousands of Coloradoans to celebrate the laying of the cornerstone. By then, the estimated cost for the project had grown from an original limit of one million to more than two million dollars. Both the original contractor and Myers himself had been summarily fired due to cost overruns. The journey before them, obviously, would be a long one. But if the capital's construction process was chaotic, the task of building Colorado's government was more turbulent by far.